Story number one. We arrived in the United States many years ago, likely among the few who sought refuge in the Pana refugee camp of Thailand. For those unfamiliar, Pana held an eerie reputation. Rumors circulated that it was once a battlefield, claiming the lives of many soldiers and civilians. Despite its pleasant daytime weather, even the Thai security personnel dared not linger after nightfall. With little to occupy our time, as Hmong, we reveled in childhood games like tag, hide and seek, and the traditional Chinese jump rope. As the sun dipped below the horizon and the stifling heat subsided, children eagerly spilled outside to play. Yet, as darkness descended, our innocent games took on a sinister tone within the confines of the flea market. I recall observing fellow children their playful movements followed by ominous apparitions. My elder sister shared my unease, urging us to retreat home. Several weeks later, tragedy struck. Four of the children we had seen, trailed by haunting shadows, fell gravely ill and passed away. Of the twelve who played, four succumbed to illness. Not all of them fall ill simultaneously. Rather, it seems that one would become sick and succumb to death, after which the others would also fall ill. They would witness the previously deceased child standing at the corner before their own demise. Concerned by the mounting toll, our parents feared malevolent spirits targeted the camp's youngest inhabitants. In response, my grandfather performed a shamanic ritual known as soul hiding on my sister and me, tethering protective strings to ward off the malevolent entities. The ritual is to hide our souls, so that evil spirits cannot take them. As the deaths continued, the Hmong community convened a shamanic ritual to uncover the cause. Prior to the ceremony, the shaman gleaned insight, revealing that spirits residing in the camp harbored resentment toward noisy nighttime play. In the spiritual realm, the spirits remained at war, and loud disturbances drew unwanted attention from their adversaries. To placate the restless spirits, the Hmong elders sacrificed four cows as an offering, beseeching the spirits to spare the lives of the camp's children. Subsequently, an agreement was reached. The spirits would abstain from claiming further young lives, provided the children refrained from disruptive nighttime activities. With each new arrival to the camp, families received solemn warnings. Camp leaders admonished fathers and husbands to keep their children indoors after sunset, cautioning that the ancient tree stumps surrounding us harbored disfavor toward nighttime revelry. Thus, in Pana, the laughter of children ceased with the setting sun. By the way, the ancient tree stumps, if referring to evil spirit and ghosts, thank you. Story number two. When you move into the Thailand refugee camp, Pana, you and your family will be assigned a room. Those rooms are built like a motel, with each family assigned to a room, and it doesn't matter how many members are in your family. People who come to live in Pana don't stay for very long before they are either sent to the US, France, or Australia. During our time there, many people ended up dying and we were assigned to a room where an old man had passed away previously. The residents of the building informed us that a funeral had been held in the room. They even warned us not to sleep by the wall where the body was placed during the funeral. The Pana refugee camp was split into two sections, the old and the new. There was a cemented road which runs through the two sides and was guarded by Thai officers. One cannot cross to the other side without some kind of special passes. My father often snuck out to the new side of the camp at night because his second wife was placed there. I remember one night I was on the verge of falling asleep when I heard the door creak open and saw what looked like my father entering. My mother was already asleep at the time. Then I heard my mother kicking and banging the bed with her leg 
In the dark room, I could make out a shadow standing by my mother's side of the bed, so I called out, Dad! Dad! Mom! Mom! Neither my father nor mother responded, but my mother was kicking, so I reached for the light by her pillow and turned it on. There, I saw a man with a deformed, rotted face dressed in a blue soccer jersey choking my mother. When I directed the light towards him, he turned his face away, revealing that it wasn't my father. Terrified, I began calling out to my mother. The figure released my mother and walked out of the door. My mother, still somewhat asleep, only fully woke up when I started calling and shaking her. Realizing she had been paralyzed by the entity, she turned on my father's light too. Just then my mother shone the light under the door and saw a blue rotted face with dark patches peering in at us. We huddled together in fear as our next door neighbor knocked and asked if everything was okay. Soon all the neighbors gathered, concerned about the commotion. My mother recounted the incident, and though the men searched the area, they found no one. However, they believed us, knowing our room was where a funeral had taken place. The following day, when my father returned, we told him what had happened, and even the neighbor advised him against leaving us alone at night. Shortly afterward, my father's second wife and her family immigrated to America, so my father no longer ventured to the other side to sleep. That experience remains one of the scariest moments of my life. Many Hmong people were buried just outside the camp's fence, and we lived close to that area. Later, before coming to the U.S., my mother learned from other women in the camp that when the man passed away, they had dressed him in a blue soccer jersey and covered him with Hmong funeral attire. Thus, we realized that the figure we had seen that night was the old man who had died in our room. Story number three. In Pana, the rooms provided to each family are very small. Consequently, many families keep their household items outside, such as pans, pots, and other things. Due to this, there are many thieves in the camp. If you and your neighbor don't form a group to watch over the property at night, your belongings will get stolen. Each building houses eight families, and everyone shares two bathrooms located outside the building. I remember during that time, our building and the adjacent one formed a group to stay up at night. For instance, one night, it was me and another man from our building who were supposed to stay up all night and watch over the property. Then the next night, it was another two men from the other building. We took turns. We lived close to the countryside of the camp. One night, during the month when it gets very cold and foggy, I and another man named Chue were out. We had no guns, just knives and sticks. We were hiding in the area where people take baths, which had a lot of water containers. It was around 2 a.m. by this time, and no one was out. Chue and I heard what sounded like two men talking, though we couldn't make out what they were saying. We looked toward the side where the Hmong had been carrying their dead outside. There were two men holding each other by the shoulder, appearing drunk and talking. They were walking toward our street, stumbling because of their intoxication. They veered closer and closer to the side of the road, where there was a small creek, and it seemed like they just fell into it. Chue and I wondered if they were drunk and had fallen into the creek, possibly dying there without emerging. After a while, they still hadn't surfaced, so Chue and I decided to investigate. When we arrived, there was nothing and no one inside the creek. We got scared and returned to the area where the containers were. The next day, we discussed the incident with the men in the camp. Some families who had lived there for a while were familiar with events that had occurred in the area. Where we lived, there was a tall tower. According to the Hmong who resided there, when the Hmong first moved in, there were Thai officers guarding the area. Stationed atop the tower at night to ensure that Hmong people weren't engaging in any illicit activities. However, there weren't many people around at the time. One day, the two Thai officers saw a Hmong lady and decided to kidnap, rape her, and then kill her afterward. After some time, while the officers were on duty, 
they thought they heard someone climbing up the tower. Upon looking down, they saw a shadow climbing the ladder, so they yelled at the person not to climb. However, when they saw the ugly, rotted face of the lady they had raped, they became terrified. With no means of escape, the two Thai officers jumped down the tower and ended up dead. After that, no Thai officer guarded the tower at night anymore. The residents who had been there for a while told Chu and me that we might have seen the ghosts of those two Thai officers. Story number four. In Pana, I was around 12 years old. I knew where the Hmong people buried their dead. There were two sites. One was towards the east side, where there was a little stream. Then there was one towards the north side, where there were two or three of those tall, wooden towers. I remember one day after we went to school and learned some English, my neighbor's son, Tong, wanted my brother and me to go outside the camp, towards the side where there's a little stream. We knew that there were graves there, but he wanted to go catch some fish and freshwater shrimp. Tong was around 15 years old and I was 12, with my brother, Beng, who was only 10. Being the naughty kids that we were, we decided to go with Tong. Once we got to the fence, we didn't see any Thai officers, so we went outside the fence. That place was full of sword bean trees. Those trees were tall, and they had beans as big as knives. We would pick up a few just to carry with us and play ninjas along the way. Tong was the oldest, so he told my brother and me to follow his instructions once we reached the graveyard. When we got there to the graveyard, there were some older graves, but there was one that only had dirt and nothing growing on top of it. It was like a fresh new grave. Some of the older graves had things growing on top. We walked past the new grave and went all the way to where the stream formed a little pond, and we started catching fish using our shirts. While catching fish, I noticed that Beng's right ear was getting more and more red, so I asked him why his ear was like that, and he said he didn't know. We have a belief that when your ear is like that, it means your parents are angry at you or looking for you. We caught some fish, so we wanted to go back, but Tong didn't want to go back yet. We waited for Tong, and we kept telling him that we wanted to go back before it got dark. Finally, he said, if we wanted to go, then we should go, and he would come back later by himself. Bing and I decided to return, and as we got closer and closer to the graveyard, it felt like someone was watching us. We were scared, but I kept telling Bing not to run, just walk. We got back home safely, and my father noticed we were kind of dirty, and he knew we went out to catch fish. I was older, so my father didn't hit me but he beat up Bang. It was true that my parents were arguing about us not being home after school. Maybe that's why Bang's ear was red. That night, Tong's father came over and asked where we went today because Tong came back scared and didn't make sense. We told them where we went and that when Bang and I wanted to come home, Tong didn't, so he stayed behind. After they did a shamanic ritual, the shaman had to go do a soul calling at the place where Tong had fallen. What happened was that after Tong caught some fish, he was coming back, and up ahead he saw a boy sitting on the fresh grave. Tong thought it was Beng. The boy on the grave was wearing a red shirt like Beng, so Tong thought it was Beng sitting there, and he went to ask what Beng was doing. But when the boy turned his head, Tong noticed the pale blue face of the boy. The boy's forehead was peeling. That boy wasn't Bang, it was something else. So Tong got scared and dropped his fish, running back to the camp. Tong stumbled and fell a few times before he was able to get back inside the refugee camp. According to my father, there was a little kid around Bang's age who had died recently in the camp and was just buried in that graveyard four days ago. Tong continued to get sick after that, even after the shamanic ritual, name change, and everything. In the camp, if you had some kind of sickness, they wouldn't allow you to come to America. So, their family was stuck in the camp. My family and I came to the U.S., and later we found out that Tong had died. 
Nowadays, we don't know where Tong's family went, but I think they might have come to the U.S. too, because many of their relatives came to the U.S. That's all for this video. Thank you for making all the way through and supporting my stories. Have a wonderful day or night.